Spirit of God swept over the waters. God is on the move. The Spirit of God speaks creation into existence. The Spirit of God calls us to trust. The first, please remain standing for the first hymn, The God of Abraham Praise, in United Methodist Hymnal 116. Everyone's going to have a chance to find the new first reading, which is Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It's in your pew Bible. The pew Bible number is 879. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us to, in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the good news. Praise, Praise to you, to you. O oh Christ. I want to invite the children to come forward.
come on up here, away from the steps. Come on up here. Yep, up here. Big, plenty of room. We get a bigger crowd than this. When we have, come on, away from, come on. Oh, there you go. There. Oh, perfect. Have a seat. All righty. So in a minute, Ms. Tortlot's going to read a story to you about a man named Abram and his wife named Sarai. Well, that's some good stuff, but you've got to wait till the end for that. Is that okay, Robbie? Can we wait? You are so good. All right, so here are Abram and Sarai. Do they look, do they look young or old? <laughs> yeah, they do. They do because they were. Now, the story that you're going to hear about today is when God talked to Abram and Sarai and said, you know what? I'm going to call you to go to a new land, to leave most of your family behind and go. I'm going to give you this land, and I'm going to give you a big family, too. And God promised, God promised, yeah, a big family, too, because they didn't have any children, even though they're old. They had no children. So anyway, uh, but, and God promised to go with them and help them. And, and he also said, Abraham, you'll be a blessing to the world. Now, Abraham might have said to God, I am too old. I'm 75 years old, I'm not strong as I used to be, and besides that, I've got all these aches and pains, and, you know, thanks for asking, but you should have asked me like 40 years ago, God. Now, a younger person might have said, whew, like, you know, you, I am too young, and if I pack up the few things I have and go someplace I don't even know about, people will think I'm crazy, so just give me a few years, God, and come back and ask me again. And another person might have said, whew, that just sounds too hard to go to some place where I don't know anybody. <gasps> what? I don't know how to talk to people I don't know. I don't know anything about that. It's too scary. And it's a long walk, too. Right. And it, it, I, it, I don't even know what to take, and it's scary, and it's a long walk. So there are a lot of reasons that people might say, I am not going to go to a new land, God, even though you want me to. But... You know, Abraham did go. He said yes. And maybe he thought these things. I don't know. But maybe he thought, God wants to make me a great nation? I didn't even know God knew me. And God knows me and wants to make me a great nation. That's a, that's a big job. Or he might say, think, God wants me to do something important. Now, I... I could do what I've been doing my whole life, and that might be okay, but God said the whole world would be blessed through me. I could really count for something. He could have said, you know, that sounds like a big, scary thing, but it's important to God. You're reading along with me. And, and I'm guessing God will be with me. It just might work. And so he goes he packs up everything, and he goes to the land that God shows him. So I want you to listen to that story when, when Miss um, Tortlot reads it. But before you go back, and before I give you your, your things here, I, I, I don't want to, we're, we're talking about the Old Testament, but I don't want to miss talking about something with you that's different in the sanctuary. So walk down here with me for just a minute. Uh, Gunny, if you just go with me here. All right, so do you notice that the the banners, turn around and look at these big banners. They have changed, right? Who are those people on the banners? We've got the, all right, the three wise men. Sometimes they're called kings. And they're, they're pointing up to the sky. They're pointing to this big star because they've heard that that is saying that Jesus, that a king of the Jews has been born, and they're going to follow that star. This past Thursday was Epiphany, the day that we celebrate or remember that they followed the star to find Jesus. And we even have that big star still hanging there. Now, again, we're talking about stories from before the time Jesus was born in worship, but I wanted you to see that. And also remember that we say God is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And we're really thinking about that light and about who God and Jesus are uh, every Sunday in church. Okay, now, do you want, if you would like... Um, a, one of the papers, here's, there's one right here, 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 well, wait a minute, is that the right one? Yeah, that's the right one, sorry. Okay, and some crayons, and if you'd like a lollipop, you can get one of those too. All right? All right.
everybody's going to be ready to uh, use the Pew Bible again. I'm going to give you a few seconds to find the second passage, which is Genesis chapter 11, verses 30, to chapter 12, verse 9. It's in Pew Bible 9. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages towards the Negeb the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God.
bound for the kingdom. Like that. Amen. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, we continue our journey through the Bible year. Many of you have chosen this to be the year that you're going to read the Bible through, verse by verse. And as, as I mentioned, there are some more books out there if you want to jump in. It's not too late. As a matter of fact, you can jump in anytime you want to through this whole year. Uh, and I hope you will. So on Sundays, I'm going to be preaching uh, from a, one text found in your reading, and it might be the text that you've read a little earlier. It might be one you're going to read the week ahead, but just kind of going along with you as you're reading. So we began last week with Genesis 1 and 2, with the story of creation. God actually spoke creation into being and, and made humanity in God's own image and formed this special bond with humanity. But we know that relationship was fraught right from the beginning. And God was, as you've read on, you found out God was heartbroken that the world turned out to be so different from what God hoped it would be. So God determined to end it all but seeing one righteous man named Noah decided to save Noah and his family. And after the flood, humanity, well, they continued to be just as they'd always been. Amen. Right. No apparent improvement in the disposition of men and women on the earth. However, God changed. God promised never to destroy the world like that again. Instead of anger toward a world that disappointed, God chose unfailing patience Amen. with a world that would continue to disappoint what God hoped for the creation. Today's story is what can be called a narrative break or a hinge point in the book of Genesis and in the story of God and humanity because something new happens. We move from the story of God calling the earth into being and really establishing this relationship with all of humanity to the story of calling a particular family into this special relationship with God, a family who will become a people and who will carry the blessing of God forward to the world. But we don't start over with a whole new set of people. Just before what uh, Valerie read today, uh, there's this genealogy of the descendants of Shem, and Shem is one of the sons of Noah who survives the, the, the flood. Excuse me. And uh, the genealogy ends with Abram and his brothers. But the story of Abram begins, well, what, in what seems like a dead end, with, with discouragement. Because the first verse, and usually that's not linked with the reading that you heard today, but the first verse you heard today is, Sarai was barren, unable to bear children. Now that word barren is a hard descriptor. It brings to mind all sorts of things. And it may seem a little odd to our modern ears when, uh, because it seems to declare that a woman is only fruitful if she bears children. And today most of us would agree that women bless the world in many ways. Amen. If they choose to have children, if they don't choose to have children, or if they're unable to. But neither do I, I want to just slough over this idea that for some women, this is a story of pain. Because for them, the inability to bear children is like a, a dead end. Amen. So I want to acknowledge that. Now in the ancient world, it's a wife's duty to give her husband a son. A man's life. His essence, they believe, is passed on through this son. And dying without a son means that a man's complete end has come. Abram's situation is, is dire. 
and barren indeed. And all evidence points to the inevitable conclusion that the line of Noah that's come down through Shem that ends in Abram is done for. There's no human way to remedy the situation. They've been trying. So it seems like there's no future for Abram and Sarai. Yet the situation is not hopeless. You see, in creation, God has already shown the power to call life into being from a barren landscape. Think about God's wind over that unformed earth. And now God calls this dead-end family and and speaks life-giving promises to them. God says, leave this land, leave your family and your father's household, at least most of it. And if you do this, I will give you the land. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name respected. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Amen. Five times God says, I will. God makes these extravagant promises to Abram and Sarai. Now, in our self-made man kind of world, sometimes we just can't imagine that such extravagant promises, such lavish gifts could come from God and God alone. One of the ironies of the, our current way of thinking is that we celebrate our freedom to do and be what we want to be, yet we often believe that the present life is in a way closed. We think nothing new can ever happen again apart from our own ability to make it happen. No gift, no gift can be given to change things. It's all up to us. Oh my goodness, I wouldn't speak so fervently about that if I didn't see myself in it. And that kind of deeply ingrained thinking leads to one thing it can lead to is overgrown uh, pride in our own accomplishments. Or worse, it can lead to deep despair over the dead ends that we face. Hmm. Abram and Sarai have tried to secure their own well-being and enduring name, but they've come up short. They're open. They're open now for new life, ready to receive God's promised gifts. This immobilized, dead-end family becomes a responsive family, ready to move. Abram and Sarai accept the call of God and embrace all of the promise without one bit of proof that it's going to come true. Hmm. They renounce everything they know and love, their home and most of their family, and they set out for this new place. They just go. And that's the essence of faith, isn't it? They become the archetypes for all disciples who forsake everything and and follow wherever God leads them into unknown places. If I'm honest, and maybe if you're honest too, we'll admit that self-renunciation just doesn't play that well with most of us. Especially when we don't know, when we don't know how something's going to turn out. Yeah, that's part of our Christian ethic too, isn't it? Jesus said to the disciples, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And a little bit later on, he said, you know, all who want to save their lives will lose them. And those who lose their lives for my sake and the good news will save them. Jesus also enters this open invitation, right, to uh, give up our lives for him. But it's also terribly unspecific. But contained in that that, uh, promise is this promise that we can move out of the barrenness of a life that's lived totally for ourselves into a life that really is a life, a life that has the potential for blessing the world. And that requires us to, to make a decision to follow Jesus and to repent. Now, I'm not talking about the I'm sorry kind of repentance. I mean, there's a place for that. But rather, I'm talking about the kind of repentance that involves changing our heart and our lives, to turn away from the lives that may seem barren, and start going in a new direction. 
I've shared before that my, my call to ministry came out to ordained ministry. I feel like I've always been in ministry. But the call to ordained ministry came out of a sense of loss and barrenness. I was grieved at the death of my mother. She was the one person who had known me from before I was born, the one human anyway. Right? She was my last living parent and you know when you lose your last living parent those of you who have had that experience sometimes it causes this crisis in your life uh, this where you realize man life is short and for a while I felt like I was at a dead end and as I prayed and I ruminated over that summer of 2005 I felt this sense of God's comfort a clear message from God Martha you know I'm able to bring life out of death and then later this message, you also know I've been calling you to ordained ministry for a while now, and this is the last time I'm going to ask. Now let me tell you, when I said yes to that call, I couldn't imagine all that it would mean. But it's in an interesting thing, the Board of Ordained Ministry, they'll ask, what's God calling you to? And the first time they ask that question, you go, hmm beats me. <laughs> I mean, you have to make up something, right? But, 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 but you're, you're just not sure. And honestly, although you get more of an idea, uh, there are some things you just can't know, Amen. right? You just have to uh, turn around in faith and start putting one foot in front of the other to fall, follow the call of God. Now, there have been losses and there have been trials along the way. I, I'm not going to lie to you, but there's also been a great blessing a lot of them, and the opportunity to be a blessing. But I'm no different from you. I am no different from you. God is calling you too, maybe not to ordained ministry, but to some ministry that serves the purposes of God. No matter what God is calling you to do, you're going to need faith to give up on certain things and embrace new ones so that you'll be blessed and be a blessing to the world. You know, only you know where you stand today. Maybe life is fine and you're pleased with all you've accomplished and you can't imagine that God would add one more thing to make your life any sweeter. Or maybe you think, well, it's, maybe it's time to start listening for God's call and for God's promises because you're willing to accept the idea that God has gracious gifts for you beyond what you can imagine or make for yourself. Amen. Maybe, maybe you're at a dead end and you want to believe that God can bring new life into the barrenness of your life. Wherever you find yourself this morning, this story is for you. Amen. It's for you. It's a reminder that God is calling you to trust God and to take the first step, or maybe the next faithful step, into God's future for you. A future in which you become one who uh, extends God's blessing to others to this world that God loves so much. So may you be ready and willing to take either the first step or the next faithful step Amen. into that future. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is The Summons. It's from The Faith We Sing, that small black hymnal, page number 2130. And I invite you to rise and, and listen to this summons as expressed in the hymn.
please be seated. I invite you just to, to a time of a few moments of silence before the prayer. The prayer I'll be praying is from Douglas Underhill. Spirit of movement in hearts and lives, we would rather stay where we are. We want your calling to mean that we're already doing what we should be doing. We want your love to mean that all we do is approved and that our failings are ignored. We want your power to sanctify us to mean that you're finished with us, that we are complete as we are and can resist change. We do not want to move. We do not want to be moved. And yet we know you will move us. We will be uprooted, called out, sent out into a strange country. We will be shaken, turned, pushed, pulled. And so we plant our feet in solid ground, stiffen our necks, and cross our arms. Knowing if we were rooted in you, we would be moving already. We ask that you bring us close, embrace us, and surround us. Be present in us and with us, so that when you move, we move. When you move, we move. Thank you, Lord, that you care enough to move us and that you also care enough to hear the concerns of our hearts this day. And so we pray to you for those who are sick in body or spirit. We remember the mother of Luke Case as she is being removed from life support. And we pray for Luke, this young man losing his mother. We pray for uh, Hoadam, a beloved uncle and brother of the Dulé family. We pray for Talia's uncle Sonny. We pray for Connie. Virginia, Elizabeth, Susan and her brother, for Evelyn, Julian, Paul, and Sue, and others we name before you now. We ask for your comfort for those who grieve especially the, the uh, Carr family and the Pritchett and Rishti families. And now, O oh Lord, as those who are called to follow you, we pray the, the life-forming prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
a reminder that as you're reading in your Bible, you may come across some of these ancient Hebrew names of, of God. I invite you now to stand and to turn to the people that are around you and wish them the peace of Christ this day. Peace, everyone. Also with you, Tom. As you're seated, I will uh, in, just remind you that if you brought He's offerings from the ball wings. today, there are two boxes out on that table in the middle of the narthex that you can slip that in. We also accept offering through the mail or through uh, the online giving platform that you can access through our website. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts as a church. We thank all of you who support the church with your, uh, your prayers, with your presence, with your gifts, with your service and with your witness to the love of Christ. Amen. So I invite you uh, now to uh, enjoy this offertory by Ray Wa. This is, this, sorry about the bulletin today, it's all me. But she's, she'll be playing Balletto by Mozart. I hope I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> Join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of being part of your family and for your desire that we should love one another. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, 
for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. I invite you to turn in the faith we sing, the small black hymnal, and to 2241 and sing, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. Indeed. invite you to uh, stay for coffee hour and to get to know somebody new today. And as you go, I send you with this blessing. May the love of God go with you wherever God may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storms. May God bring you back rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you back rejoicing once again into these doors. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.